I want you to open your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of John. St. John, chapter 10. I'll give you a few moments to turn there. St. John, chapter 10. Now, I don't preach long sermons. Some guys go 45 minutes, 50 minutes, some guys an hour, some longer than an hour. That's just not my style of public speaking or preaching. If I can get to my point and say what I think needs to be said, then all I can do is trust the Holy Spirit to use it after that, do what he wants to do with it. Turn, if you will, to John chapter 10, and let's read the first four verses there. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. <clears throat> I'll stop right there. My text is going to be verse 3. To him, that will be Christ, the porter openeth. By the way, a porter was a doorkeeper. Some guy whose job was to open and close it for people going in and out. And the sheep hear his voice, Christ's voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. Dale Carnegie, who was the famous self-help motivational speaker, would often say, the sweetest sound in any language is the sound of a person's own name. Nothing is more annoying than to call some business and the first question the person asks is, can I have your account number, please? It's impersonal. Nobody wants to be thought of only as a number. But it's an inescapable part of our world, an unavoidable part of our world these days. So if you're going to be a number, at least you want to be number one, right? Which presents a problem for all of you because I'm number one. When you hear your own name called by someone, it means that right at that moment, you are the focus of their attention. For some reason, you're, you're significant right at that moment. You're sitting in the lobby at a doctor's office. They finally call your name, and you go through that door back into the examining room. You know, you sit there a long, little longer, wait for the doctor. You're at a crowded restaurant, waiting to be seated. They finally call your party's name. Then you get to do that little victory walk. Yeah, it's our turn now, you losers. <laughs> when I was in Bible school, Brother Ron Fort, who is retired now, but he was an instructor in Pensacola Bible Institute. He taught the life of Christ. He taught Hebrew and Greek. <clears throat> but he and I and several men joined a men's softball team, played in a church league. Church softball teams are real big in the South, more so than they are out West here. But one game, it was my turn at bat. And I could hear the other guys in my dugout saying, come on, Brother Shribe, let's get a hit. And everything was always very proper and uh, respectful. Brother Shribe, Brother Fort, Brother Wilson, etc. And um, I heard him say, come on, Mike, let's get something started. And right at that moment, when I heard my name, I knew that I was more than just his student. I was his friend. When someone calls you by name, it can convey many things to you about their interest in you right at that time. And uh, at least six times, the Lord Jesus called people by their name to comfort them, to minister to them, to instruct them in some way. And uh, I want to call your attention to those six places today, and I've titled this, He Calleth Them By Name. He Calleth Them By Name. And uh, I'll have you turn to a few places, but uh, to start with, let's turn to forward a page to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Verse 
John 11 and verse 41 says, Then took they away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And then verses 43 and 44. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him, and let him go. First, let me say this. Jesus Christ called Lazarus by name from death to life. Amen. It's been said that if Christ had not specified Lazarus, maybe all the dead buried in that area may have come forth. This miracle shows the supernatural power of the Lord Jesus Christ. The raising of Lazarus from the dead was a preview, however temporary, of what believers expect one day. Lazarus had to die again, eventually. Unless there's a 2,000-year-old man we haven't found yet walking around. But um, just before Christ raised him back to life, he said to his sister Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That's a great picture of every Christian who's died before now. And, die, and will die before the rapture takes place. He says, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's a great picture of those who are still alive when the rapture does take place. I hope that's you and I. I hope it's today. I hope it's now. I hope the rapture takes place before I finish this sentence. And there in John 11, verses 25 and 26. And Christ asked her, Believest thou this? And she answered, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world, there in verse 27. He gave her confidence in that belief by raising her dead brother back to life from the dead. And uh, the Lord, no real believer expects to die and then remain dead. He doesn't expect, do you know something? They used to call the rapture the great getting up morning. There's a corny gospel quartet song uh, called, When I Wake Up to Sleep No More. I like the turn of the phrase there. Nobody can turn a phrase quite like a country western singer. And some of these southern gospel quartet songwriters, they turn a phrase very cleverly. But uh, no Christian in the New Testament is ever described as being dead. Or dying. They simply fall asleep. Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. And so forth. And it's the idea that when you sleep, it's with the expectation that you're going to wake up again in the morning. So no Christian dies expecting to stay dead. That's why it's important for your name to be written in heaven. For your name to be in the Lamb's Book of Life. So that if you die before the rapture takes place... You die with the hope and the expectation of being uh, resurrected at the rapture with every other believer. And uh, if you're still living when the rapture takes place, you don't have to worry about going to the cemetery or the grave. You're going to rise with them all. But it's important for you to know that you're saved, that your name is written in heaven. Today is November 3rd, 2019. In two days, November 5th, will be what? Every single one of you should know. November 5th will be my spiritual birthday. 52 years ago. Which is strange since I'm only 42 years old. <laughs> but 52 years ago, November 5th, 1967, I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. I trust Him to save me. And it's about three feet from where I'm standing now. It's where I knelt down on my knees and asked God to forgive me. It's been a tremendous blessing, uh, unlike any other. And it's the most vivid memory of my early childhood. I was six years old, but it's just as fresh in my mind as if it happened two weeks ago. And I hope it never does fade. But it's good to know that God has called you from death to life. Amen. Next, I want you to turn to the book of Luke, 
chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Luke 10. And we'll begin there at verse 38 through verse 42. Luke 10, starting at verse 38. Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. This will be Lazarus' sister. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Secondly, the Lord Jesus called Martha by name from worry to rest. From worry to rest. Believers can get caught up in all kinds of secondary things that are not as important as the main thing. Martha was worried that the Lord and the apostles uh, were taken care of, they were made comfortable, and her sister Mary was listening to Jesus preaching and she wasn't helping. And the Lord Jesus told her, one thing is truly important and your sister has figured it out. The most important pursuit in your life as a Christian now pay close attention to this. The most important endeavor, the most important pursuit in your life as a believer is not to be the world's greatest soul winner. It is not to be the most gifted uh, and effective public speaker so you can preach or teach a Sunday school class or do any number of things. The most important pursuit in your life as a believer is to know Jesus Christ and be a disciple of him. A knowledge of Jesus Christ by his words. And Mary figured that out. Martha was preoccupied with things of a secondary importance. Sometimes we get, we get our eyes fixed on some things and miss that which is most important. For example, you're, you want to read through your Bible systematically and be a good disciple of the Lord Jesus. And so you, you rush through it. You check off those daily readings that are you know, on those charts but you don't enjoy what you're reading. You go through the motions, but you're not really enjoying what you're reading. You're not paying attention to what you're reading and asking the Holy Spirit to speak to you along the way. So let me say that again. The most important pursuit in your life is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ by his words. And since the Lord Jesus is not physically on the earth now as he once was, he has given us the Bible. And it's through the written word of God we hold in our hands that we can talk to God and he talks back to us. That's how you have fellowship with God. You talk to him when you pray and he talks to you when you read his book. It's a two-way conversation and they should both be part of a believer's daily life and daily routine. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me there in Matthew 11. Uh, Paul prayed that I may know him, Philippians 3 Verse 10, Jesus said, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. John 14, verse 33. But the most important pursuit of a Christian is to learn of the Lord Jesus Christ through his words. The Christian should never put, off, uh, put other things ahead of that objective. That should be your number one objective, your number one goal, is to be a true, devoted disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's your devotion to Him that should then make you a better student at school, a better son, a better daughter, uh, a better friend, a better worker, a better boss, a better man or woman in every respect. But the first thing should be your love and your uh, devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything else is secondary. Just like Martha, Christ wants to call you from worry to rest. Turn, if you will, to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. After Jesus' resurrection, he appeared to his disciples, but 
Thomas was not there. And uh, after they had told Thomas that they had seen the resurrected Lord, he said to his, the, the other disciples, John 20, verse 25, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of, his, of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Later, <clears throat> Jesus appeared to them all, and he invited Thomas to see his hands, and to touch his hands, touch his side, where the spear had gone. And Thomas said, My Lord and my God, there in verse 28. The Lord Jesus said to him, there in John 20, verse 29, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Third, let me say this, Christ called Thomas from doubt to faith. From doubt to faith. The Bible tells us now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Since the Lord ascended back up to heaven, Thomas is a great example of the kind of faith you and I must have in the Lord Jesus Christ. I've never seen where they put the nails into the hands of the Lord Jesus or the nails into his feet. I've never seen where the soldier thrust a spear into Christ's side or where the crown of thorns was placed on his head. I don't even know what the Lord Jesus exactly looked like, nor do you. But I do believe long before I was ever born, Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross of Mount Calvary as the perfect Son of God, suffering for the sins that I would one day commit. He died in my place. He died before I was even born for the sins that I would one day perform and and offend a holy God. He was judged on my behalf. He was judged for my sins, my transgressions against God. And he asked me to believe by faith. That's the kind of faith he generated in Thomas at that moment. Do you realize that Thomas, by just about all church historians, uh, agree that Thomas went as far away as India preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ as early as 41 AD. Long before the legend of Buddha was ever generated in that part of the world. The whole story of the Buddha, 550, 600 years before Christ, is a myth. The Buddha never existed. It's a legend. You say, well, how could a legend spread like that all over the world? Well, how does the story of Santa Claus spread all over the world? Everybody knows there is no such person as Santa Claus. And yet that story, that legend gets bigger and bigger every year with the retelling of it. There's a new movie about Christmas each year, right? And the, the, the story gets larger and larger and larger. And uh, the person of Santa Claus never existed. And yet it's just about a religion for millions of people. But Thomas went all the way to India preaching the faith of Jesus Christ like there was no tomorrow. He went crazy preaching that far away. Point number four, turn if you will to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. We read there in verse 15, so when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. John 21, verse 15. Christ called Peter by name from weakness to devotion. From weakness to devotion. Christ no sooner said it than Peter started wondering if John might get some privilege that he wasn't going to get. What was he going to do with John, his friend? Uh, would John be given some opportunity, some blessing that he might not get? Evidently, Peter was unaware that he had just been made the Pope by the Lord Jesus. He didn't know about that. Clearly, clearly he wasn't the Pope, and he was wondering if John would get something that he wasn't going to get. 
Uh, Paul writes about believers who do this, and he says, quote, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. It's a weakness of your flesh to always wonder what someone else is doing, what somebody else is getting away with. Do they have something that I should have? Are they able to do something that I should be able to do? Are they going to receive something that I'm not going to get? And this was the weakness in Simon Peter. The Lord Jesus told him, If I will that he tarry, John, till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. There in John 21, verse 22. If I allow John to remain alive and live until I return, what do you care? You follow me. The Lord Jesus said effectively, follow thou me and mind your own business. It's funny how the Lord Jesus talked to the first pope. In Matthew 16, he called him Satan. And here he said, mind your own business. <laughs> and then in Galatians 2, he lets the Apostle Paul, a traveling evangelist, re reprove and rebuke Simon Peter for teaching heresy. And then he goes so far as to let Paul write about it and spread it around and tell everybody else about it. That's not a good way to treat the first pope. Simon Peter proved to be loyal to the Lord Jesus Christ later on the day of Pentecost. He preached a tremendous sermon uh, resulting in the conversion of 3,000 Jews. So he called him from, from weakness to devotion. Next, I want you to turn to John, back to John chapter 20. After Christ's resurrection, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early in the morning and uh, discovered it empty. And uh, she thought he was the, the, the gardener, the keeper of the place, speaking to her. At the end of verse 15, she said, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. In John 20, verse 16, we read, Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Point number five, the Lord Jesus called Mary by name from sorrow to joy. From sorrow to joy. Back uh, in Luke chapter 8, verse 2, it says that Mary Magdalene had once had seven devils, unclean spirits that the Lord Jesus Christ cast out of her. And she was one of his most loyal disciples. She attended his mother at the foot of the cross with other women at the crucifixion. To think that Christ had once had power to cast the unclean spirits out of her, but now he was dead because of the, at the hands of an angry mob. Must have been more than she could wrap her mind around. How could these things happen? How could it have turned out this way? But at the mention of her name, and the sound of his voice, she probably wasn't even looking up when she talked to, said, and said, Sir. She's probably looking down, not even looking at the face of the one who was addressing her. And then she hears, she hears her name and hears his voice clearly. Her doubt, her sorrow, her sadness, her grief was turned to joy, unspeakable and full of glory. You and I are... Uh, not looking for the undertaker, we're looking for the upper taker. We're looking for the one who can save a soul from death, uh, who can and eternal hell, and can rejuvenate these bodies one day and give us perfect glorified bodies that will never wear out, that will never decay. I'm looking forward to that. You know, liberals like to believe in the good, lovely, lowly Galilean who spoke gracious, lovely words, and taught wonderful lessons, and this is the one they, they put all their emphasis in. You and I believe in the one who died and was buried and rose again from the dead. This Jesus over here can't save. This one sure can. Amen. But he called Mary from sorrow to joy. Well, I'm so glad we, we serve a risen Savior. Amen. I'm glad we serve... We think about... The, the object or the focus of our worship and our devotion, we worship someone who came into the world, lived a life of a physical man, was put to death, was murdered. I mean, a gruesome, bloody murder, too. Not just a little, you know, gas chamber, some little thing like that, take a poison capsule. No, 
He was murdered and, and scourged and beaten bloody and nails driven through his body and then come, comes back to life after three days and three nights. This is the one we worship. I don't worship one who's, who preached the Sermon on the Mount. I worship the one who rose from uh, the grave. Lastly, turn, if you will, to the book of Acts, chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, we read about the conversion of the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus. Acts chapter 9, and starting there at verse 3, I'll read verses 3 through 6. Verse 3 begins, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? The Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And then in Galatians, Paul writes about his new life, serving Jesus Christ, teaching the churches, and he said, But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. And they glorified God in me. Galatians 1, verses 23 and 24. Point number six, let me say this today. Christ called Saul, or Paul, from anger to apostleship. From anger to apostleship. A man who had tried to stop the preaching of Jesus Christ, this new fledgling faith of believers in a risen Savior. He tried to stop it, to squelch it, to keep it from prospering. And uh, thought by leading uh, Christ's followers to prison uh, and persecuting them, he would somehow stop this from spreading. People would get discouraged and say, well, we better not preach Jesus because of the persecution we might receive. But rather than be discouraged, they were more encouraged. They kept preaching even more because of the persecution. And uh, Paul wrote, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Ephesians 5, verses, verse, verse 16, rather. You know, for a man who had persecuted the early church, he wanted to make up for lost time. He wanted to make up for all the things he had done against the true believers and became the strongest preacher, the greatest preacher uh, this world has ever seen. Probably the greatest Christian in the history of the New Testament church was the Apostle Paul. Of the 27 books in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul wrote 14 of those. He was the greatest Christian who ever lived, without doubt. The order and the work of the local church was taught to us by him. Every generation of believers will one day have to give account to their obedience to his doctrines and uh, to his order of church governance as laid out in the New Testament. That should be self-evident to someone who reads the Bible. But Christ called Paul by name from anger to apostleship. To think that he had persecuted men and women, hauling them into prison, must have weighed heavy on his conscience. You know, when you have a guilty conscience, it's hard to sleep at night. And he must have thought about how patient and um, gracious those believers had taken the persecution he launched against them. And it ate, it ate away at him. It ate away at him. What you possess, what you have, what you know, what you've experienced is different in your case than any other believer's case. And God knows you. He knows more about you than you know about you. He knew more about the Apostle Paul than Paul knew about himself. And he said, I can take that zeal to persecute believers, I'm going to turn it around and make it a zeal to reach men and women for Jesus' sake. God knows you. 
He knows your talents. He knows your weaknesses. He knows the things that are most important to you, the things that you're obsessed with and controlled by. And he can sometimes take those natural interests and turn them in his direction. If you're yielded, if you're willing, and say, God, I'm not even sure what my strong suit is, what my strong points are, but if you can use something I possess to serve you more effectively and more persuasively to tell lost people how to be saved, then God, please do so. Use me in some way. God turned the Apostle Paul from anger to apostleship. Sometimes you'll hear a sermon or a lesson some Bible uh, preacher offers, and uh, it's as though what he's saying is speaking to you directly. Because he doesn't know anything about you, but it's as though what you're hearing is God speaking to you directly. How does this guy know all about me? He's been reading my texts. He's been reading my emails. He knows everything I've been doing during the week. We had a guy, and I, I mentioned his name. You would know who he is. We had a man come forward after one of our church services to be saved, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago maybe. And uh, I dealt with him about his soul and his salvation. And he says, it's as though everything you were preaching was directed right at me. It's like you knew all about me. I didn't know anything about him. But God did. God is able to reach the heart. He's able to reach the soul and reach into you and speak to you if you let him. God still speaks to men and women that way. He still wants to call you by name. God's calling you. He wants you to do something for his honor. He wants you to glorify him in some way. He wants you to become a more devoted disciple of Jesus Christ. He wants him, his own son to be the most important figure in your life. And to know him by his book. If you're a Christian and you've been neglecting your Bible reading, shame on you. God wants to speak to you by name and say, get your nose back in my book. Start reading my book again. You know, you don't want to die as a Christian having never learned anything about the Bible. There may be a test. And if that book was here by the providence of God, and men and women over the centuries shed their blood and were tormented and in jailed, uh, or uh, imprisoned because of their faith in keeping that book alive, then there's probably going to be a test. A lot was paid for, a lot has been sacrificed, so you and I could have a copy of the Word of God in our own hands. Don't just treat it with slight and indifference and say, well, I'll get around to it. Well, when? When are you going to get around to it? When are you going to read it? There may be a test. Don't put it past the Lord to say, listen, have you ever read such and such and you're, oh my goodness, um, I never read any of it. You don't want that to happen. The word of God and becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ has to become the most important pursuit in your life as a true follower of Jesus Christ. He wants to call you from uh, complacency to active faith in Jesus Christ. The good shepherd calls his own sheep by name. No two sheep in the flock are exactly alike, but God knows you. He knows more about you than, than even you know about you. And he knows how he can use you. He knows how he can bless you. <laughs> If that makes any sense, maybe it's time for us to have an altar call today.